Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Hummingbird Hour. It is Tuesday, what is it? Tuesday, June 29th, almost the end of Pride Month. Um, we will, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some what I call filler right content right now so we can let all our wonderful esteemed guests join us uh, in the participant space. Thank you so much for, for being with us today um, for our, our final um, conversation of Pride Month. Um, but just, just in case anyone wasn't sure, I will still be gay on July 1st. Um, so when Pride Month ends, I'm still gay. Um, and I think that Andre and JD would both say that they're both still gay or queer. We'll talk more about how we each identify as we, as we start this conversation. So I see we have a, a fairly good group already in the room, so I will officially kick things off. So hi, everyone. Happy Pride. Welcome to Hummingbird Hour. Um, as the, the screen says, uh, the session will be recorded um, and uh, closed captioning will be available on the, uh, the viewing for viewers who watch the, um, uh, the recording later as well. Um, so uh, we wanna make sure that we're, our content is accessible to everyone as much as possible. Um, so I'm gonna stop the sharing now. So uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Brian McComick. I am the founder of Hummingbird Humanity, which is a firm that focuses on building human-centered workplace cultures. And um, we started the, the Hummingbird Humanity a year ago, or just over a year ago. It's almost 13 months uh, uh, now, um, where, during the height of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, we've built uh, a firm together. Andre and JD have both been part of that journey uh, where we work with um, companies to create spaces that are welcoming to everyone. Um, I also identify as a gay man and a person with a disability. And um, I'm really um, grateful for the series of conversations that we've been able to, to share uh, during Pride Month. So if you've, if you've missed any of them, uh, the first week of Pride we had uh, in June, uh, we had Gracie Harkema, uh, who is a wonderful human, um, a, um, an immigrant from um, Africa, um, a, a black queer woman, um, and a, a really phenomenal DEI professional. So um, that was uh, the first week of June. Then we had Natasha Poroskova and Julia Hamilton talked about supporting queer women in the workplace uh, the second week. Uh, the third week, we had Bryce Salato and Ben Green, who are um, both uh, openly transgender men who um, shared about beyond pronouns. Uh, we, uh, many of us put pronouns on our signature lines and on our Zoom screens, um, and they talked about um, some of the, the next steps to making sure that everyone feels inclusive in the, the gender spectrum of identity and expression. Uh, last week, we released our paper representation matters with props to jd who was the author of that paper um, so if you haven't seen it yet uh feel please please check out the hummingbird website and and get download your copy and then today um for our final conversation we are we have two queer people of color jd Valladares williams and andre herring who are going to talk about their experience um, of pride not feeling inclusive. Um, and before I pass the virtual mic over to Andre and JD, I, I wanted to share um, that uh, I think, you know, I was, as I was sharing with JD and Andre just before we joined, I saw this, um, uh, this graphic on, on LinkedIn, I think it was this, this morning or last night, it all blurs together. Um, that shows, um, and and for some, as we were talking about, the, there's a there's some aspects of the graphic that not everyone loves of seeing people below water, which doesn't feel good, but the concept of, um, of the chiseled white gay cisgender man, um, circuit, circuit boys. Um, and I have friends that fall in that community who are good humans and uh, who wanna make the world a better place for everyone as well. Uh, but that it, there is a, there's something that feels like the, the work to, to make pride inclusive has really benefited individuals with that identity. Um, and that, this is a story I want JD and Andre to really tell, but it's something that I was just sharing with them that I feel as well. Um, I, um, I've never really fit the mold of the, the hip, cool, uh, sort of in the, in the middle of the crowd, 
I, I've always, I've, I'm six, six. And so as much as I've tried to work out and exercise, I've either been too thin or overweight. Um, and, uh, and so even for me, um, while the world without question has given me privileges that I'm aware of and that I try to use to benefit others, um, this conversation actually, I think is really relevant for me as well. So I suspect as, as I'm listening with all of you, uh, they Andre and JD are going to uh, spark my, spark my heart and feelings and emotions as well. So with that, I, without further ado, I want to pass it over to the two of you. I'm going to go behind the scenes. I will share links in the chat, answer questions, um, and um, happy pride, gentlemen, and uh, distinguished guests. And I'll um, pass it over, Andre Diddy. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, one, I want to re-shout out um, the thought leadership paper that you and JD worked on. It is wonderful. If you have not read it before, please do. I will be sharing it on all my social media platforms right after this. Um, amazing. And it does highlight their, our conversation around representation of having inclusive movements. I personally identify as um, Black, queer, or gay, I use them interchangeably, even though they're different. Black, queer, cisgender man who's chronically mentally ill. Um, I will also allow my um, my accomplice in crime <laughs> introduce themselves as well. Hey everyone, my name is JD. I use he or they pronouns. I identify as queer as far as my sexuality and my identity. Uh, I am also Latinx and I am an immigrant. So those are the things that are part of my lived experience and that have definitely shaped my LGBT experience in a different way than others. And something we wanna talk about today. So let's go there about the iceberg. So that iceberg is sometimes the reason why I don't leave my house for certain places because I just don't have the mindset to um, deal with feeling othered or feel like um, feeling different and or, um, and we're not gonna lie. I think when we look at how society filters messaging, it affects you whether you um, look akin to the people at the top of the iceberg, whether you're being pressured to look like the people at the iceberg or whether you feel like you'll never look like the people at the iceberg. It does have internalized messages for everyone and we all react to it differently. In terms of our pride conversation and how pride needs to become more inclusive, um, this conversation, as I warn all of you, it might be a little more New York centric, but we will be touching on other prides and other places in the country and around the world. So just to give some context, um, because the New York pride is one of the, the most prolific just because of the origins of how it started, um, 52 years ago with the first throne being stone, the stone being thrown by um, Marsha um, P. Johnson in literally to fight off with the cops to protect the community as a black trans woman. Um, essentially, I don't know if people were around for the world pride in 2020. Well, not 20, well, 20, 2019, we had world pride. And it was tons of people around the world showing up everywhere to be. However, the following year, we went through a pandemic. And it really showed all of our disparities. It showed how our identities are affecting the way that we live. It showed, it highlighted the amount of violence that Black trans women and, and Latina trans women are experiencing. It highlighted the um, joblessness and the homelessness that um, queer women in general experience and it highlighted the also the experience of black queer men are we're not um we're not immune to the same issues that happen to cisgender straight black men but we have that and extra right and there's so many issues whether it's from um immigrants being mistreated um through policy and by law enforcement or housing right so there's so many issues we did have and we saw that played out however um Unfortunately, um, the official New York Pride, um, New York City Pride, the organization itself was not very vocal about the issues that were being faced by the communities here in New York. Um, and the queer community here has always been parts of multiple communities. It has not been vocal about the experiences of women in the community, trans women as long, women, trans women are women, but talking about trans issues and what that impacts people, people of color, immigrants, people with disabilities, and chronic conditions, it did not talk about or immigration status, right? It did not discuss any of these things. And however, what we saw is that people were really angry 
<laughs> about the inability and the silence of the organization in not saying anything. Um, so essentially people move towards a march called the Queer Liberation March. I don't know if you've learned of it. The Queer Liberation March is um, a union of different communities that is um, that partitions away from corporate, it partitions away from um, capitalistic um, behaviors. And it really is purely about activism. Um, and just kind of like, because of that, it's not the only march that has splintered outside or the only pride that is splintered outside of um, generic I would say the generic pride that we see, that you see actually on the top of the iceberg. We have um, Black Pride, we have Harlem Pride, we have Queens Pride, we have, um, I go to Black Prides in different parts of the country. There's Black Pride in London, there's so many different prides. Um, JD, as someone who has showed up to Queens Pride, you wanna share a bit about how that work, how that is? Yeah, I think <clears throat> something that we're not aware of um, is our history. And that's because a lot of times history is passed on from generation to generation and LGBT people don't have that. They usually don't have those connections to the older generations because it's not passed through your biological family. It's usually your chosen family. And that's only if they also know the history. So being someone who grew up in Queens, I've been in Queens since I was 12 and I still live here. I love Queens. It's the most diverse place in the world. It's the most diverse neighborhood in the world literally. So I needed to know um, more about the origins of Queen's Pride. So I did some research. And it was due to in the 1970s, um, a gay Latino man was leaving a bar in Jackson Heights. And he was approached by two men who were asking him for a lighter. And he went over and they beat him with a hammer in a school playground near the area. So this person was killed. Um, the community went to the police to open up an investigation. And the police gave the case to a detective that was on vacation because they didn't see a queer life as something important. So the community decided to hold a vigil. And once they held a vigil in Jackson Heights, they saw the amount of people that showed up and they decided to march to Gracie Mansion, where the mayor lives in the Upper East Side, and demand that they find the people that killed this man accountable, that they hold him accountable. And because of that is why now we have Queen's Pride every year, the first Sunday of, uh, of June. And there's a stop for a minute at the playground where he was killed. Um, so there are all these other prides and other origins for other places because of the same problems of, the, of people not valuing uh, queer people of color's lives the same, putting them to the side and the community really having to come together to do something about it. So it's nothing new in the past, it's nothing new in the future. It's something that's always been going on and those queer people of color are always pushed to the back. I would love to show a clip about being pushed in the, <laughs> in the back um, figuratively and literally. Um, please bear with me. One second. There is, there is a wonderful video I would love to share with the people. Um, I would love, love to share. All right. And And my computer is going slower than you. Okay, cool. Let me know if everyone can hear. Just, um, well, JD, if you can tell me if you can hear it. Our nation was founded on a bedrock principle. And we are all created equal. Seneca Falls, Selma, and Stonewall. Ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Figured out. Grew up in Kansas, and Mama probably baked apple pies. Yo, everybody, this is Danny. Danny, 
Welcome to New York. Don't use your real name. It was run by the mob. We're an organization that fights for gay rights. Are you looking at faggot? in a peaceful way and resist the radicalism that I see starting to take hold. I have not seen one dream come true on Christopher Street, baby. There is no hope. There is no family, Danny. I like being mad. These kids have nothing left to lose. I can't love not the way, Danny. It's the only way. Hey, so having a parade commemorates fighting. We're going to call it Gay Liberation March. I'm coming. Yeah, that came out in 2004. Yeah, so um, let's talk about what we saw. <laughs> both you and I were working at LGBT organizations at the time that this Little video came out. And <laughs> yeah, it was very troubling to watch that. Um, I, was I like, think one question that we can um, answer right now is that the director is German and a straight white man. Yeah, um, it was super inaccurate. I saw Marsha, but like she was in the background as if she didn't lead the movement. And <laughs> um, a stone was not thrown at the stone wall. <laughs> it was actually thrown at the police. Um, the and not by a gay white man. No, a, a black trans woman. And actually trans women, um, Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, other trans women of color were actually fighting physically first, right? and taking those um, attacks from the police for um, cisgender straight, sorry, cisgender gay men, right? And it's just very troubling to see that video, right? And to see like how inaccurate, but that is the way that this film was gonna teach LGBT history. And when we talk about LGBTQ history and saying how we have our chosen family to teach us, we don't have relatives that teach us this information. We actually have to seek it out. And if this was a general um, narrative, you're literally going to walk around and think that's what happened. You're going to think that there was um, a white man running around throwing the stone, um, leading Marsha when it was the other way around, and throwing a stone at the building that is historic. So it was just kind of wild. And it's a true story. And it's like, no, that's not a true story. There's nothing true about this story at all, um, other than maybe the raids. But there's nothing true about the story. Outside of What's true, it's how the community um, responded to Sylvia Rivera, who was one of the two queer trans women that um, started the movement, um, how she was received a few years later um, as the movement continued. And I can show you, we can actually show you, we're not talking about it now, we can actually show you how this was. Because this shows why our community is not inclusive. This shows why even though somebody began this movement, they were pushed to the back a few years later at one of the marches. And you'll see how they booed her, even though she started the movement. I've been trying to get up here all day. 
for your gay brothers and your gay sisters in jail that write me every motherfucking week and ask for your So that is a bit about um, the way that Sylvia was treated. And that was in 1973, literally about four years after um, the Stonewall riots. And those people booing her were not straight people. <laughs> those were not, those were people within the community. And it's very troubling to see how the erasure on how quickly um, it was to let's push her aside because had she looked like one of the people at the top of the iceberg, she would never receive that treatment. However, because she looked like someone under the water, um, she was receiving those behaviors. Um, it is just very troubling because even though we think that 1973 is so far away, literally during World Pride, we watched, um, we heard incidents about how um, two trans women of color spoke up at in, within the Stonewall, the bar that their ancestors fought for. They spoke up about issues happening to trans women of color, specifically the violence and the homelessness and the, um, the, the criminalization of sex work. And essentially what had happened was people booed them and actually called the police on them. This is during World Pride. This is, a, this is the 50th anniversary of someone that looked like them defending everyone else and this is the way they were treated. So these are very troubling narratives that still have continued. This, these are biases and hate. And I think we also have to acknowledge all because we're within the same community doesn't mean that we don't carry biases and hate against each other. Um, we are all programmed in the same very um, flawed society. So that's something that we don't like to confront that these are things that we hold um, dear to us that we need to release and let go of. Absolutely, there's a lot of internalized hate within our community, and it's because we've absorbed it from our surroundings. But it's also up to us, just like we're always trying to be aware of unconscious bias, of also looking at how we're treating each other within groups that are oppressed. Are we lifting other people that are oppressed, or are we just pushing them out of the way to just benefit ourselves only? And when we talk about the segregation that occurs between us, we can even look at, because I, I, we both have worked within the LGBT um, HIV AIDS movement and um, no shade to the people who have done tons of work and tons of support in our movement, but the people who are leaders in the movement have dramatically looked cis and white, cisgender and white for quite some time. Um, I think this, these past couple of years was the first wave that we're seeing one people of color, trans people, people who do not look um, like the people at the top of the iceberg, right? People that they can say, quote unquote, sell, right? Um, the, these are the people who are running the show. And it's, they're also the disconnect because if you're saying we do programming for black and brown youth, but there's no black and brown people at the top. Um, there is a disconnect, you know, classist system, classic be, classist behaviors pop out. Right, if you're saying, oh, we wanna support trans people, but everyone is cisgender, that's saying we need to support trans people, but you don't have trans people in your life. You don't wanna hear their narrative. You only wanna put them on, a sh on stage for a gala and then throw them away after the gala is over. You don't care about the fact that they deal with homelessness. You do, you look down on the fact that they have to use sex working to survive, right? These are things that we are seeing within the own movement of the work that we're supposed to do. Not corporate, we're talking about nonprofit, social justice, organizations, and also the erasure within the movement and outside of the movement. Because if you look at tons of other um, LGBTQ people who work in other movements, their voices are also diminished. Their voices are diminished in immigration rights. Their voices are diminished in black rights. Their voices are diminished in women rights. They're diminished in disability rights. They're diminished in so many movements, um, regardless of what they look like, the minute they are not cis and white, they are removed. So this is something that we both saw. Um, I feel like we bonded over this a couple of times. <laughs> um, look, looking, you know, we looked at each other and we're like, well, we're not up there. <laughs> we're not up there and we're also not in charge of um, any decision making. So something that happens at previous places where I've worked is 
it wasn't until I got there and realized I was the only person of color in a management level that I started speaking up of, hey, if we're working with this population of LGBT youth in the New York City area, and we know that there's a lot of black and brown folks that are part of that population, why aren't the people that we're bringing to these spaces also queer people of color? How is that representation going from this nonprofit and the work you want to do to the actual community that you want to serve? And that's something that I think we can talk about now on how ERGs can change that, how you as part of uh, LGBT affinity group at work can really um, start taking those steps to, to change the narrative. Because the facts are half of half of LGBT people are not out at work. That's the facts right now. It's also the fact that one in five Gen Z identify as LGBT. So these people are at your company. These people are the future of the workforce. And so if you're not creating an environment for them that is truly safe, how are they going to show up at work? So let's talk about some ways in which ERGs can really re uh, really lead that movement? I mean, I think a first step is making sure that the only people who are leading the ERG are not the people who look like people who are at the top of the iceberg. Um, there's a couple of corporations I could call out that I know of that are like that, but I'm not going to do that for the sake of, <laughs> sake of this wonderful organization called um, Bird Humanity. I'm not going to do that. But tons of corporate um, affinity and employee resource groups that are supposed to cater to the LGBTQ plus community tend to only be the G and tend to look a certain type of way. And anyone else who voices an issue is told, oh, well, there's another organization for that, right? Or, you know, I feel like you need to bring it to the women's group or you need to bring it to this group or this group, right? And understanding that this specific ERG is supposed to, is more of a very intersectional um, approach. You're supposed to cater to so many different issues because it's a very diverse community and if, in essence if you're not addressing any of their needs you're not addressing anything right so it's really troubling to see that um and kind of also understanding who works at these corporations right one a lot of corporations tend to be the most um privileged who tend to be white who tend to be cis right but also if there are people of color or women or people who don't traditionally fall under um, the privileged range, it's talented tenth, and that's a very small number of people still. And that, you know, so essentially, this is not a great represent representation of the world. And you might not even be getting the most healthy representation within people who are quote unquote underrepresented in those ERGs. So it's important to understand who makes up these ERGs and how you're gonna work to recruit people who look more like the world in the room or honestly, even people who do fit the top of the iceberg, they may have invisible identities that they feel like they can't talk about. They can't bring that up in Fire Island. <laughs> they can't bring that up when they're at events. They can't bring that up at charity events. They might not feel comfortable saying that they're HIV positive. They may not feel comfortable saying that they live with a, um, a, a disability or that they're neurodivergent or that they're mentally ill um, or that they might have a chronic disorder. They might not bring these topics up. Um, because of the fact that they know that their position in the social realm of what we view as acceptable and not acceptable, they will be removed, right? Because this pressure falls on everyone. It's not uh, people at the top of the iceberg are immune to that pressure. They are in the top of the iceberg because they feel that pressure, right? So having conversations about who is not in the room and who is actually in the room but doesn't feel like they can say the other parts of them that should be in the room, right? So having those conversations on who's here, where are we getting these people from? Are they able to be their full selves? As well as um, discussing like how we make decisions, right? Um, are we gonna have these real conversations at work or we're gonna be like, oh, well, we're actually planning only for like June 1st to June 20th, June 30th, we're gonna have our logo change and we're gonna have a couple events. They're all gonna be fun alcohol filled events, which also excludes sober people. We're gonna have a bunch of alcohol filled events and we are just about partying this whole like couple of days, like month. And then after that, we don't talk. And 
when we talk about also the places that they're like, let's donate, right? HRC and tons of other organizations do amazing, amazing work. The Trevor Project does amazing work, right? Um, however, those are the organizations that tend to cannibalize um, charitable donations and smaller grassroots organizations that tend to also make what less than $10 million are not provided the opportunity to gain any funding or, no, or, or attention. So it becomes really unsettling because it's the same organizations everyone gives money to. And like, for instance, the Rain Rainbow Railroad doesn't get as much money as they should. Um, it's a Canadian based nonprofit that focuses on supporting um, refugees within our entire diaspora around the world. Um, tons of great work. They're a global organization. Most of you might not even know what Rainbow Railroad was until I brought it up today. That's an organization that deserves tons and tons of money or BYP 100. It's a um, led by a black queer woman um, and it kind of splintered outside of, you know, Black Lives Matter and color of change because they wanted to focus more intersectionally on black queer issues. These are organizations that we don't hear about, don't talk about. Um, as another member of coming from the nonprofit world, as I guess we both departed, what are your thoughts as well about the cannibalization of charitable donations? Yeah, I think something that companies usually do is, you know, try to, I think the good intent is always there of wanting to do something for the community, especially during Pride Month, but it's, how are you going about this? So questions for your ERG are intersectionality. Are you working? So for example, my identities are queer, Latinx, and immigrant. So are you including the Latinx ERG group? in um, collaborating in some event together? Are you collaborating with the Black ERG, with the parent ERG? Because there are all these different intersectionalities that come with being LGBT that also need to be addressed. And I think something that companies don't want to do and they really shy away from is being political. My existence is political. I can't help it. It's and why is it political? Because there's still 29 states in the U.S. that can discriminate against me legally. Um, there's 250 bills that have been or are in the process of passing um, anti-trans legislation just this year alone. So, what I'm when companies say they don't want to get political, my question to those companies and the ERGs that are there trying to amplify these voices is if one in five Gen Z are identified as LGBT and there's 29 states that discriminate against them, how will your employees really show up at work? How can they really be themselves if there are still laws in place that discriminate against them? So when companies say, I don't want to get political, I have no choice as an individual, and I'm going to turn to the company that is trying to advocate for my rights so that I can have the same freedoms as everyone. I don't. At the moment, I don't. If we really talk about America, I don't have the same rights. So what is the company doing with their power, with their leverage, with their money to change that? I mean, I think the sad part is when we talk about what's political and what's not political. Everything is political, right? Everything, the minute that you need to create a policy to have a conversation or an initiative about something, it then makes it political. And the nature of what companies do, if we move away from even um, the LGBTQ community, just the lobbying of making sure that your products and your brand can go um, outside of general general location of what you want and trying to expand that in, in itself is political because you're asking for your brand to exist upon different communities in different areas right so trying to remove um or redefine the word political right and trying to understand that everything is political the minute you want to change your logo to rainbow that is political but for some reason we like to use the word and move it away from certain things and change the meaning of it and understand that 
everything in essence is political and we should have a conversation about it all. There's no way to have a diversity, equity or inclusion or belonging conversation without it being political, right? There's nothing about lobbying that's not political. It's, the, it's like the pure of purity of um, political. So I think also asking, figuring out how um, LGBTQ ERGs, right, can have can elevate with their companies to have certain conversations year round instead of just June and say, hey, like how do we collaborate with other ERGs? How do we um, ask for more inclusive policies? And also how are we going to reach our customer base? Because let's be truthfully honest, compassion does not move all of us. Sometimes we have to talk about the business case because not everybody's there, right? And talk, because money makes people move and understanding like, it's not just your employees, but your how are you going to endorse your brand or your product or your services to the outside world? And people are like, oh, well, we're not gonna hit those consumers. And it's like, well, unfortunately, like we mentioned, um, like you said, one out of six Gen Z identify within the community. Nearly half of Gen Z within the United States is not white. And these things are not also are reflective in countries of other diversity, kind of like the, the UK and Australia and South Africa. These countries also highlight in France and Germany. These countries also highlight the same trends that are happening here. 77% of Gen Z will consider a company to take on a job if they're diverse, right? They're not gonna accept a role, that's 77%. 69% of millennials, I mean, I'm proud of talking about my age, I don't care. I'm still, I'm still quite, I'm comfortable. 69% um, of millennials report staying in a job five years or longer if it's diverse, right? These are real important things when you talk about what type of people wanna work in your workplace, what type of people should be included. I believe what the, the majority of the population within the next 20 years is going to be Latinx. The, by 2050, half of the US will be people of color. And also back to your um, point about the customer base and a point that somebody also brought up in the chat is globally, the LGBT population has over 3.7 trillion in buying power. Mm -hmm. So there is a customer base there that you need to address if you want to stay in business. And it's only going to be growing as people feel more comfortable coming out. So there really is a business case for you to try to take these initiatives. There is a business case for you speaking up against anti-trans legislation that is going on in this moment because your future employees care about those things and want to see you address it with the power that you have as an entity. I mean, 3.7 trillion is huge. And I mean, also other communities just make the number bigger and bigger, right? <clears throat> I think the thing, and I love, um, I don't know if you're, if, I mean, we all are familiar with Jennifer Brown, but if you're not, um, one of the things that she says frequently to, and she can say this actually as a cis white woman, <laughs> she can say this very easily without, um, I can't say this, but she'll tell um, business leaders, change or die. And I think that is where we're moving to. The world is changing, whether people like it or not, the world's going to continue to change. And it's changing in a better direction, but we need to adjust to it. And a, and a part of what ERGs are structured for is to help companies culturally move in that direction. Um, that, is what, that is what those entities are for. So I think it, there is, yes, it's not necessarily always the responsibility of people to educate others about their experience, but also I don't wanna discount that ERGs are not also filled with the communities that, are with, that they're representing. They're also filled with allies. And mobilizing people who are straight and who are cis and who are not part of um, queer communities to be in the ERG and to help support advocating, right? Who are who is your executive sponsors, right? Are they advocating enough? Who are you having a relationship to your board? Are you trying to bring proper representation to your board? These are conversations that we need to continue to have, but I believe that there these structures are created to make change, not just because you know to exhaust the LGBTQ plus community there, but to use the allies present as a mechanism to make change. So 
I think that the ERG community has a very strong um, responsibility to help push companies to think differently, to change their practices, to adapt to the world that we're going into. But that can only happen if we have more diverse groups within those ERGs and that they're doing collaborative events with one another and actually having conversations about intersectionality. I think that's one of the biggest things missing in our conversation. People say intersectionality and they're like, well, yeah, it's the diversity of like thoughts and hobbies and this and that. And it's like, no, it's not. Like, let's, you know, like Kimberly, first of all, anytime you talk about it, we have to talk about Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, she is still living. She is not dead. <laughs> she is very much living. Um, and she is um, a, she is a, um, Black feminist, and she is a also critical race theorist and intersectional feminist. And she discusses intersectionality is about how your collective identities in, inform the levels and different types of oppressions you face and the privileges that you may um, be granted. Now, everybody's experience is unique. Everyone is unique. And that, when we talk about that, she also centers on who's the most oppressed, right? If you're not gonna talk about the most oppressed, you're not gonna help no one. So if you don't care about tr like trans immigrants, right? You're not helping immigrants, you're not helping anybody else because you're not talking about the most oppressed. And that's where this conversation always has to lean towards because when we talk about intersectionality, we love to go to what brings us comfort and say, well, we all have this and we all that. Yes, we all have intersectionality, but the whole point of the theory is to also move towards who is suffering the most and uplift them, right? Everyone else has the right to vote because black people have the right to vote in the, in the United States. Um, people can own property because it was pushed now that indigenous people can have slightly more higher property rights. It is not where it needs to be, but it also is the reason why we have so many property issues in this country because of the displacement of both um, what we view as, um, and I say this word only because I've been given permission to say this word and also communities have used it. Um, American indigenous or American Indian people, right? Who, um, tribes, they, them and also on top of that, um, Latinx indigenous people who have been displaced um, from Mexico and Guatemala, who this land belongs to. These are the reasons why we have homelessness, right? These are the problem reasons why we have discrimination in our housing. It's the reason why you file an application to buy a house, you have to put your race. And you know that number is going down. Um, and these are things that we hope that ERG communities can use their leverage and their power to do something. I know that it feels quite powerless sometimes within those communities to feel like, I don't feel like I have a voice. I feel like I don't have nothing. And it's like, you do have more of a voice. You actually have access to budget. You have access to powerful people. You have access to connections and you also have access to expertise. And you also have the space and I'm making assumptions, but if you work for a um, giant corporation, I'm under the high assumption that you um, have, you're not worried about your basic needs, right? So that gives you the opportunity to sit down and think because some people don't have the ability to reflect because they're busy trying to survive, right? So I think it's important to use these resources that are to your disposal. Even if you feel powerless, you're not exactly as powerless as you think you are. And there are people out there that need you. So I think it's important for people to also look at the ways that they have privilege within themselves or near them in their proximity and try to use it as much as they can. Because I think that there is a strong power that ERGs can have to support the communities outside of them. Yeah, something to add to your point about, you know, those people really, the ERGs addressing the problems is to keep in mind that those that are most oppressed in our community are probably not our coworkers. They're probably not at the companies where we're working, but they are part of our community. They are part of what is important to me. So when I'm looking to work for a company, I'm looking to see if they are talking about black trans lives because while I have experienced my own oppression, my own problems, my own obstacles, I realize that within our community, black trans lives are the ones that are most at risk. This year is projected to be the deadliest year so far for uh, trans people with 27 deaths so far this year. Last year, there were 44 in the year. This year, we're halfway through the year and there's already 27. 
So this is the problem. This is the problem that we need to address in our community of people literally still being killed for being who they are. So to me as an individual, I'm not ready to celebrate unless it's amplifying the joy of those people. I'm not ready to celebrate that I'm free while these people are still struggling to just live because the laws keep trying to pass against them existing. And I think, and to be specific, is also that's just the United States. The numbers get worse when you leave this country, right? The numbers get worse when we talk about Latin America and the Caribbean and Africa and Asia and even parts of Europe, right? Australia, the numbers get worse. And we choose to avoid these numbers. And look, I'm going to have a real moment right now. I'm just going to go there. It is troubling to see that we decide, especially as cis people who aren't, might not be, we're not gender non-conforming or non-binary, right? So I'm talking about cis people who are not, right? Part of those communities. We choose this month or this weekend to gender bend, but we do not talk about trans people all year round. We, we are comfortable being told that, oh, it's acceptable for me to do this this month. And then once July hits, I'm taking off my wig and my dress and anything that, um, violates the code of traditional gender, but I'm not going to have a conversation about the people that I'm trying to actually emulate. I'm not talking about trans people or non-binary people or gender non-conforming people. And, and also, I just want to make sure these are all three different communities. They're not umbrella. They're all very different. And we do not talk about that, right? So and I, I love how RJ mentioned, yeah, people think it's Halloween. It does make my stomach somewhat twirl a bit because I'm like, you do not speak about these issues year round. And then you're like, well, I'm gonna dress up like for the weekend. And I'm like, some people can't dress up. This is part of who they are. Um, yeah, we, so we have to talk about the something that people don't talk about in New York City. And it's if you live in an underrepresented community in a black and brown community, how you show up to Pride is not how you go home. Uh -uh, you how you show up to Pride as as you're walk as you're making your way back to where you live, you start taking those parts of your identity off and trying to protect yourself so that you're not attacked. That's still real life right now. I mean, for I, people in New York City. I mean, we've been at so. we've seen them people. We've seen the girls. You start taking out the makeup wipes on the middle of the L train or the A train, wiping off stuff off your body, removing stuff, removing your little fake, you know, tattoos. And starting to, you know, you pull out, you have an extra shirt in your bag that no one knew about that's a solid color. And these are things that, um, yeah, if you're not living in the village, if you're not living in Hell's Kitchen, if you're not living in Chelsea, sometimes you're possibly not living in Astoria or Fort Greene or downtown Brooklyn, you are removing parts of your clothing off. You're removing it off because out of safety and you also know that you don't have whiteness to protect you because you're like, well, they're going to touch me because I'm technically part of their community. So and the like, police won't do anything about it because it's their own communities are fighting each other. So it's not our problem. They're going to be like, that's black and black crime. We're minding our business. <laughs> da, da, da. And it's just, these are the things that we have to be concerned about in understanding how people walk into the room, right? How we walk into the room, how we walk around. So yes, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little troubled. I'm still a little troubled at this moment about viewing people celebrate certain things. And I'm just like, this is not a part of your experience. You get to live somewhere where you don't have to worry about that. And don't get me wrong, there, are, there is homophobic and transphobic behavior um, that does occur in Hell's Kitchen and neighborhoods like that. But it's not to the same extent where if you've never had to start removing pieces of clothing on your way home, that is a very different experience. And I've experienced that pretty much all of my existence, right? So I wanna actually open it up for questions because um, there are tons of wonderful people on this chat and I would love to open it up for all of you. Um, feel free to um, put some questions in the um, chat or you can actually send them to us um, privately if you don't want people to know that you're asking that question. I would love to answer um, in JD or just if you want to have a dialogue. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> OK. 
Okay. Ooh, oh my God. Okay, Courtney, you trying to go there today. Um, I'm just going to read out the question just in case people don't see it. Um, the question is, I work at a college. Can you share any experiences from your college experiences where you can pinpoint where the college failed in helping you feel included or on the other end where the college housing and student activities, student organ organizations may have succeeded? Looking to see where we can bridge those gaps. That is an amazing question. Um, um, well, I, well, <laughs> I was going to say what you were talking. I had an idea. Sorry? Uh, no, well, you were thinking I had an idea. Of, you go uh, right ahead. You go right ahead. Some, no, just something to keep in mind, at least in my own experience, is when I graduated high school, and this is the experience for a lot of LGBT youth, is really your first time to explore your identity because you're stepping out into the real world. And so college is really a great way to find that community. And in my experience, I didn't find that community because it was just, I found the gay white men in the campus because they were the most visible. So I became friends with them. And then I realized that that wasn't necessarily my community. And it took me until my thirties to really find my community. And it would have been really helpful if my college did more outreach they had an LGBT group, but if they really did outreach and focused on bringing in allies, because sometimes allies are just LGBT people that aren't ready to come out, but want to be part of it. So I think really stressing the importance that you don't have to be part of this group in order to advocate and support this group. And also something that was really important with the schools that I've been working with is having those leaders that are straight or not part of the community in general show up to those meetings, have faculty that is not part of the community show up for the community. And they're the ones that are going to show other people that it's okay to join this club, even though you're an ally. That it, it doesn't mean that you're low key gay if you join this, that there are people in positions of power at the school that will also join the conversation to amplify the voice of the community. That's incredibly important for colleges to do, not just have an LGBT club. No, that, that is strong. Um, I think I went to a SUNY school. Um, so that's a state, um, as a state university or college school within the state of New York. And I felt like my school was supportive of LGBTQ people, like people would come out. Um, and I think it was supportive. And we had amazing also courses to educate people in programming, which I really was inspired about. I think the one place that we might have dropped the ball on, and I don't want to say it's necessarily the school, but it, so Greek life has a ton of um, culture. They run culture in a lot of schools and athletics. And I did not think that the athletics nor the Greek life was very inviting. Some of them were trying, right? But I think as a whole, they have, there's so much more work to be done. And it's a reason why many people stayed in the closet. And I think if, not saying people, everybody wants to join Greek life for being part of sports, but I think if it did look inclusive in these areas, it would make people feel comfortable saying, oh, well, the sports team has um, out people and people are open and friendly about it, or the fraternities and sororities have out people and people are fine with it. Um, it makes people more comfortable. And I don't, I think they were working towards that. I don't, of course I don't go there no more, but I don't know how far they're going, but I think they were trying. Um, as an intersectional person uh, on the other end, I felt like they were suffering with blackness. I, don't, I think they really weren't good at that. Um, one example, and they have worked towards that. Um, there was a fraternity that used to have um, a table that had the um, Confederate flag on the back of the table and it was very visible all over campus and nobody would do anything about it. Um, that was very unsettling and people didn't realize that was a problem. And I'm also like, this is New York. This flag doesn't even fly, like this flag, this flag's not even around the state this often. So they're like, oh, well, it's, you know, traditional. And I'm like, well, so is the swastika is also traditional. And for some people too, this is not, doesn't mean this is an okay um, symbol to have. Um, but that's what I will say. Um, I want to um, leave it up to one more question. Thank you. One more question or thought I see. 
I see that uh, Michael Stevens has raised his hand. I'm going to make him a panelist Ooh, to share with us. This is just the voice from the background. I'm going to disappear again. <laughs> You're like, I'm God. <laughs> you hear me? Hey, Andre. Hi, JD. Hello. Hi, Brian. How are you doing? Good, welcome, welcome. So happy you're part of the conversation. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for today. I really enjoyed listening. Um, my question was actually around the fact that there's, there's been an increase in kind of this conversation over the last kind of 12, 18 months, but I saw kind of like a similar thing happening with regards to like the mental health conversation. And I just wondered, do you feel as though we're actually kind of breaking out of the community of people that are actually working within this space? Or are we kind of talking a lot just to ourselves? Because how much are we actually getting through to the people that are at the top of that iceberg? Or kind of are we just um, really kind of creating a bit of an echo chamber of, of people that want to make a difference, but um, I think struggling to maybe kind of go a bit beyond our own kind of network and reach. Yeah. yeah. You mean in specific to like the mental health conversation? I meant, I meant more kind of, I guess, around um, the topics that we've been discussing today, really around kind of, I guess, intersectional kind of uh, struggles across um, whether it's kind of identity related or kind of, I guess, discrimination in general. I think that's where the uh, collabor cross collaboration between ERGs is super impactful. And that's where you can bring those voices in the room that have the expertise on it. Um, the other point I'll make is that the way your company or anyone's company can make a change is connecting with a community, with your local community, your local nonprofits that aren't the Trevor Project or HRC, but are those run by mostly trans people, like the Sylvia Rivera Law Project um, that doesn't have the name recognition of the other ones, but does so much work in the New York City area for our trans community that it's really do the, do the research, not you just specifically, but you know the company and the ERG leaders, do the research on what's around your area and how you can really uplift that local community. Because that's really, instead of just talking, making it into action. That's actually an action that's gonna change lives to fund those grassroots organizations. Um, I would say to jump in also about where we are in the conversations from what I'm, this is just qualitative um, where I'm witnessing. I think we are making movement, but we're also still going to what's palatable, right? So when we talk about trans people, we're only going to people who um, can pass as cis, right? Um, and when we talk about mental health, we're still really stuck on depression and anxiety and we haven't moved past other um, conditions because there's still so much more stigma. Um, when it comes to issues with um, black people, we're still stuck on like cis straight black people who also present in a certain way. Um, I think we're making headway, but I also believe that we're still sitting on palatability and that's something that we're gonna have to push through a little harder. Um, and even when we talk, let's say when we talk about appearance and like fat phobia, we are still stuck on um, the, the plus model, the plus size model, not actually someone who's not a model, right? So I think- We're just calling it model. Yeah, just call it model, yeah. And I think we're really stuck on the palatability right now, but I hope that we're, um, so I think we've hit palatability. I think we're there in conversations, but I think we have to push past that. Thank you. All right, I think we are at the, one hour left mark <laughs> i mean one minute one minute left one hour wow we were going to stretch that one minute Ooh. andre and jd thank you so much for such an authentic and real conversation um you know just uh, a, a few a few years ago i was working with the pride group um at uh, tapestry um that included uh, members uh, of the LGBTQ plus community that are people of color and a, there was a transgender person and a non-binary person in the room and I think you've probably both heard me tell this story probably more than once um, that that group um, when when we, I was asking them what they wanted to, us to do at Pride that year they said uh, can we just 
make sure it's not centered around cisgendered gay white guys, of course, which is which is people look that look like me. Um, and I, I was really grateful to that group um, for opening my eyes um, and helping me see an, another uh, through another lens and another perspective. Um, and um, and today you reminded me of that. There's always something else for me to learn and something for me to to, to understand. Um, you know, there's so many stories I could highlight from that you shared today, but the the story that the message of uh, when, you know, we, we go out to pride and then when we're on our way home, we, we sort of put back on our disguise um, to feel safe, um, I think is, is heartbreaking. Um, and as are so many of the messages that you shared with us. So I appreciate you being so honest and vulnerable. Um, it's helpful for me. Um, and you know, to Michael's question, I hope that others will that need to hear these messages will hear these messages. Um, and um, I hope it helps me do the work that I get to do better every day. Um, all of you that are, are with us, thank you for being with us. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being allies. Um, uh, you know, as uh, you know, I, I, as I'm often reminded, there's, you know, there's, so much work that we have to do. And I'm so grateful that there are so many of us who are in the conversation, who are trying to learn, who are trying to come together to make the world a better place. And that includes, of course, JD and Andre. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you again, JD and Andre. Be safe, stay well, and we'll see you all soon. Happy Pride. Bye everyone, happy Pride.